good morning and welcome to Driving Force Radio, where we seek to discover what drives today's leaders. On today's show, my co-host is Kelly De La Torre, an attorney at ALG Attorneys. Kelly's focus is really on the energy sector, working with the Department of Defense on energy security, as well as businesses here in the Rocky Mountains on their energy planning and implementation. Welcome to the show, Kelly. Thanks, Jan. Thanks for having me. You bet. I love having you here. And, and as always, we have a really interesting show today. We're, we're going to be talking about the importance of natural gas development, not only to the Rocky Mountains and to the U.S., but the importance of natural gas in developing collaborations with foreign countries, especially China. And there's, there's, there's a lot to be said here. Yeah, and, and, and it's not only that, it's, it's also how can we use the technology that was developed here in the Rocky Mountain region and more globally and create additional jobs. Well, and I, and I think this ties back to such an important point um, that, that is made in Washington um, that, you know, 95% of consumers live outside of the United States. And so bilateral trade engagement is certainly very, very important, but so is foreign direct investment. And so it's really about this two-way conversation in these, com in these ever areas and efforts that really are key. And, and you know, we know from a recent report from IHS Global Insight that the natural gas industry alone here in the United States supports over 2.8 million jobs. And so I imagine that number is just astronomical globally. Yeah, and, and opening our borders to trade, like we've just been speaking with the Canadian ambassador to the U.S. and about the importance of opening our borders to trade, and this is just another example of how to create new energy markets and how to create additional jobs and economic opportunity, and it's, it's very exciting. It is very exciting, and so I want to get right to the show. We have two fantastic guests. Alan Barber is the president of Denver Hainan Corporation. He has extensive experience in developing U.S.-China relationships to create global business opportunities. Welcome to the show, Alan. Thank you for having me. And then we're honored to have Professor Zhuang, um, the director of CEFC Shanghai, the standing deputy director of the Center for National Strategies of Shanghai Zhao Tong University, and the general Sh secretary of Shanghai Society for Pacific Region Economic Development. He is a professor at the School of International and Public Affairs of Zha Shanghai Zhao Tong University. Welcome to the show, Professor Zhuang. Thank you. Alan, you've been right in the middle of sort of creating these um, relationships between companies in China and the U.S. And, and in particular, President Chen of China CEFC Energy Company visited Colorado to learn more about sort of uh, shale gas technology and, and began to establish relationships. Can you provide some background to how that trip came about and, and what were the outcomes of that trip? Okay, quick background. I've been working with the Metro Mayor's Caucus which is a organization of 41 mayors along the Front Range. The northernmost is Firestone, the southernmost is Colorado Springs, and the mayors want to bring more economic prosperity to the region. So I started working with them a few years ago and helping them develop relationships with China. As a result of that, uh, Professor Zhuang and I have known each other for a couple of years. So he is working with Hua Xin, CEFC Energy, and they wanted to come to the U.S. They're doing some other work. So he and I had a discussion, and he convinced President Chen that he should come to Denver. And uh, that was the first time that President Chen had come to the United States, and Denver was his first stop. So we were very fortunate to get him here. And China CEFC Energy Company is a very large energy company. Um, if you were on the fortune list, you would be in the 50s. So it's a substantial company. Uh, I, um, we started working on this. I met with Zhuang in uh, Shanghai early April. And two weeks later, they came to Denver put together a program, understood what they needed. A lot of things we're going to discuss today were apparent in that program, or before I put the uh, schedule together, because there are a number of misunderstandings that I learned in Beijing that I knew would it be appropriate for this trip. And there were, uh, but more importantly, is that China CEFC is very interested in shale gas. So with the Niobrara, Denver-Julesburg Basin, 
Eagle Ford Bakken. This is a very good location for a Chinese oil and gas company to center on what they want to do. Uh, the result of the trip, um, they want to joint venture with Colorado companies. They want to work with Colorado institutions like Colorado School of Mines. And they also want to purchase coal. So it's an expensive thing. Uh, they were just here end of April. Uh, Mr. Zhuang is back now going to the Western Energy Alliance annual meeting. We'll go there tomorrow. So I would say the um, result of the trip is so far so good. <laughs> Professor Zhuang, um, th there's really this two-way conversation going on and, and a, a trying to build a cooperation, a collaboration between China and the U.S. Tell me what those implications are for your organization um, in your perspective. Why is it important for us to be having these two-way conversations? Uh, I think first of all, uh, it's uh, the business need because uh, CFC washing uh, need uh, coal, need gas, need oil. So I'm here to, to want to talk about the deal. Uh, second, I, I think that it's a way of uh, strengthening U.S.-China relations because if the deal is them, the business is them, uh, we can create jobs opportunity for you. Uh, as uh, also, it's in in the interest of China, so I think it's uh, beneficial. Well, Alan, as Professor Zhuang just said, you know, it, it helps create jobs, but they also have needs in in China for oil and gas and, and for natural gas and for coal and for all of those things. Where do you see the potential for companies here in the Rocky Mountains to begin to collaborate with CEFC and or other um, organizations like Professor Zhuang's? Uh, immediately, uh, gas, because anyone living here is familiar with what's happened to gas prices. Uh, what was it, five years ago, we were building terminals, maybe it's a little longer than that, to, to import liquid natural gas to the U.S. because we did not have enough. With new technologies, now we have so much that the price went from, I think it was about $8 to $2. And we're hitting, for the oil and gas producers, we're close to break even probably on costs, so it's not a good business to, uh, we need more customers. Got it. We Got need it. more customers. So the oil and gas companies here, especially the gas companies, can sell that their gas to China, probably stabilize the prices, get a better price out of it, stabilize that economy, that industry. Uh, that's short term. Uh, longer term, work with the Chinese companies to help them with the technology so that China can explore their own shale gas reserves because China has more shale gas reserve than the United States. They do not have the technology to um, extract. extract it at this point. They have technology, but it's old, old technology takes longer. I understand that uh, to do a horizontal well in China, they it took them about 11 months. Should have taken eight weeks yeah. most. So there's a technological gap. And somebody's probably going to say, well, that's great. We're going to help China get their shell gas and they'll quit buying ours. I doubt that because you have such a huge market in China. And China is making the conversion. They're trying to use less coal they want to use more natural gas. So that is a huge market given Chinese economic development and mm -hmm. continued economic development. So it will benefit a lot of companies here. So the second area is technology. And the third is just discussing among the executives what they can do, how they can work together, how can they can improve their companies, 
could be management skills, it could be um, um, ex jointly exploring new places on the planet where you can get more energy. There are numerous advantages once you start working together. Absolutely. Well, touching, touching on the technology part, how do you see that rolling out? How do you see that collaboration rolling out? Is that going to, going to be primarily with industry or industry and universities working with um, CEFC or and other Chinese companies, or how does that look? Uh, right now, it looks like industry and universities. Uh, Colorado School of Mines, you have the unconventional oil and gas institute or UNGI. So they can help a lot of companies, especially Chinese companies, on exploration, better technology, better techniques. But additionally, there are a lot of Chinese universities doing research. If we can link the universities on the research side, we'll probably come up with better technology so that you can get even more gas out of these shale deposits because as I understand it, we're not getting all the gas out of these deposits with current technology. So the more you improve the technology, the more gas you pull out of these deposits, the cleaner everything is, the better the drilling, everything can improve so that it's a much cleaner industry. So the working with the U.S. and China institutions would be great, but also the companies, because our companies are further advanced in this technology than anyone else. So it's going to be some combination between the companies and the universities. And we're already discussing a potential joint venture with a Colorado company. And this very early stage, but we are in the discussions. And with that, we would probably want to include UNGI at Mines in some role. So there's a lot in Colorado and Denver as an energy center to promote all of these things. Yeah, it, it's just another example of, we, we talk all, all the time on this show about how Colorado and the Rocky Mountain regions, we're an energy hub and not only an energy hub in new technologies, but we're an energy hub in creating, using these new technologies to um, apply to conventional energies and it's, it's amazing what we can do here in this region. A absolutely and I think Alan touched on it earlier but I want to come back to Professor Zhuang on this because you know the, the shale technology obviously is, is in use here in the Rockies and, and we're, we talk about it all the time on the news and everyone knows that it's here and Professor Zhuang um, your organization CEFC Energy created the energy the China Energy Fund Committee at private think tank focused on energy issues. Can you talk about why you guys created this think tank and what is the scope of the think tank? Uh, <coughs> CFC uh, fundamentally uh, is a think tank. Uh, it's uh, related and also supported uh, by the company, oil company, energy companies. So we want to use their resources, use their money, <laughs> Uh, to to promote our research on energy, on energy uh, uh, development, uh, the strategy, and also uh, have uh, linkage and exchanges with foreign companies and foreign institutions. So, Professor Zhuang, in the, in that area, then, um, if you want to create that impetus for this two-way collaboration. What are some of the roles for private industry to engage with CEFC? Uh, actually, this is uh, uh, the purpose of my trip. Uh, first, to establish relations uh, with those companies, uh, especially with uh, Western Union Energy Alliance. Western Energy Alliance. Uh, yes. Uh, second, to, to try to talk about some deal. Uh, to buy the oil or uh, coal or energy. Third, to invite uh, the experts or uh, some, uh, someone who are interested in our uh, energy forum, which will be held on 28th of July. 
Well, Professor Zhuang, I, I, I salute you for creating these two-way conversations between private industry and the Chinese oil and energy industry to really create this, this conversation around development and, and um, implementation in the sector. And, and what type of companies are you looking for to come to your energy forum? Are they more technology companies or, or drilling companies, everything? And what kinds of conversations are you looking to have at this forum? Uh, this forum is mainly to study, <coughs> uh, study the new uh, energy revolution. You know, it's now in you know, the world, it's, uh, the energy is undergoing a revolution. <laughs> Uh, so not only traditional but also uncon uh, unconventional. Uh -huh. uh, so we want somebody who uh, uh, have a general knowledge of the whole rev energy revolution, as well as uh, some people uh, who have uh, uh, knowledge uh, and expertise on shale gas. The, because shale gas is, uh, uh, is the, ma the main focus of this energy revolution, I think. Oh, that's interesting. So we just recently traveled to Huntsville, Alabama to speak to a company called Flybe Energy that has a liquid fluoride thorium reactor mm. and is using thorium as an energy source and, and China is actually way out front on this issue. So the energy forum actually seems like some place where they may want to go and, and collaborate also with China on, on sort of forging the way for this new nuclear technology. So that's that's what you're talking about, is, is these sort of cutting edge technologies that are out front, is something that will be covered at the Energy Forum? Or uh, <coughs> the main subject, the main thing of this energy is uh, international relations and energy. Okay. Uh, because uh, we found that the energy uh, revolution has something to do uh, or some impact on, on international relations because a foreign is uh, uh, is uh, we have so uh, large audience so we cannot have uh, so detailed discussion on the uh, the, the new uh, nuclear energy uh, energy systems we can have an introduction of this but uh, so the detailed discussion depends on the uh, private or seminar or uh, uh, something like that, not so large a foreign. Right, yes, <laughs> yeah. that makes sense. Absolutely, and, and I, I love that the forum is really focused on the traditional and the unconventional. Alan, I want to come back to you. Um, I think there are so many misconceptions between in the energy industry just in general, um, both here in the U.S. as well as abroad, and we were talking before the show that there's no official U.S.-China energy dialogue that anyone knows of. Can you talk about the implications of creating a Chinese-U.S. Di dialogue in the energy sector, as well as some of the misconceptions that are out there? I, I know you, you pointed out a few before the show started, and, and I think it's so interesting to hear this because I think people just take these, these ideas for granted that it's just there. Correct. Uh, as far as the energy dialogue, uh, we were at a meeting uh, and a member of the Department of Energy was there, was asked the question about U.S.-China energy dialogue and the answer was, we do not have an official U.S.-China energy dialogue today. I believe there was one earlier, but that's been, I won't say dropped, but it's sort of faded away. And when you have two countries that are so huge and will be the largest economies on the planet within, well, by 2020, China will have an economy probably equivalent to our GDP today. Uh, and they're not discussing issues of mutual interest and concern. That seems to be a problem. So the energy forums being hosted by CEFC are a first step and maybe a good step because these are between these forums will be more you'll include the energy executives you'll include officials uh, 
uh, Mr. Zhuang wants to invite U.S. governors to be involved, especially the Western governors, because energy is such an issue in the West. They can probably sit down and come to conclusions and agreements faster than if we have government officials running the show, because then we'll get into all the diplomatic issues and positionings that you see in these areas, which is not good or not productive. So that's one area, the mis I mean, that's one piece about doing this from a private sector standpoint. You'll have results much faster and probably better results if we get the guys who are actually doing the work sitting down and figuring out how they can work together. That is being hindered right now because of misconceptions, probably on both sides, but especially the China side. When I was in China, in earlier April, I had meetings in Beijing with some of China's top energy people. And they had this perception that we cannot buy oil, we cannot buy gas, we cannot buy coal, we cannot buy energy from the United States. And I had this discussion to find out why. And that they think there are a number of rules and regulations preventing this, there are not. So we need to clear this up and CEFC, both the think tank and the energy company are on the leading edge of starting to clear this up. Uh, additionally, last week I was speaking with an attorney in Denver who had discussed energy with an attorney at the largest law firm in China. And when he brought up energy and minerals and purchasing uh, rights and taking these to China, the Chinese attorney said, well, we can't do this because of all the regulations. The attorney explained, no, there are no regulations like this. You can take, you can do all of these things. The uh, attorney gave his Chinese attorney a, um, an email of a specialist in Denver. And within an hour, the Chinese attorney was calling the specialist to find out, is this guy really telling me the truth? Mm -hmm. So there are these misconceptions and at the level I've seen them, <clears throat> I'm not certain what triggered them. I have a theory, but something has triggered this misconception <clears throat> and it's widespread with, throughout the energy sector in China. This is one of the first things we need to correct. And by establishing a joint venture with CEFC, with a Colorado company, by exporting coal from Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, Montana, that will show that this, these regulations do not exist. We can do these things. It's a good market. You're going to get paid. It's going to stabilize markets. And think of, too, <clears throat> the coal market in the U.S. is declining now also. So what are we going to do with miners? Now, there's some people I know that would say, well, why do those miners need to do that? Why don't they get another job? These guys love to do what they're doing. Absolutely. So why are we telling them you can't do that anymore? So we can even provide a sustainable market to keep people in jobs Correct. at this point. Correct, yes. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So why does somebody have to change their lifelong career? And I've come out of the mining industry, and some of these guys, they'd rather be underground than above ground anyway. Sure. So why are we telling them they can't do this? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Kelly, we have to go to break, Alan, um, but... When we come back, we're going to be talking more about this new energy revolution. And, and I love how Professor Zhuang put that this new energy revolution encompasses both the traditional and the unconventional ways of doing this. And it's going to require collaborations from all sides and all parties and all kinds of companies. And we need to be looking at, I think I heard this correctly, Kelly, the ways we can collaborate around technologies, about job creation, about foreign direct investment, about bilateral trade, and all of these things will play huge key roles as we move forward in these bigger discussions about developing, developing energy markets here in the Rockies and, and throughout the country and, and around the world. Yeah, and how to continue that conversation and engage the right parties to make sure that all of this happens. I mean, if you really look at it, there are a lot of pieces that need to come together. Absolutely. Alan, tell listeners how they can learn more about the Denver Hainan Corporation. 
<laughs> I don't have a website. Oh, okay. <laughs> so don't don't Google him. Um, <laughs> you can Google me, and you'll and get a lot Alan, of stuff. That's Alan Barber. It's A L L E N B A R B E R of the Denver Hainan Corporation. To learn more about CEFC, go to ChinaEnergyFund.org. And to learn more about the work Kelly is doing with women in energy and all the various facets of energy that she works with, go to wie.globalnewenergynetwork.org. And to learn more about ICOSA Magazine and the work we do here, go to theicosamagazine.com. Stay tuned. We have more with CEFC, with Denver Hainan Corporation, and we'll also have um, Wesley Lavanche, La I think, of uh, Firestone coming to talk with us as well and some of the implications going on here in Colorado. Come back. And she she, Professor Zhuang. Yeah, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Good morning and welcome back to Driving Force Radio where we're seeking to discover what drives today's leaders. And in this conversation today, my co-host is Kelly De La Torre, an energy attorney with ALG Attorneys based here in Denver, Colorado. Welcome to the show, Kelly. Thanks for having me, Jan. You know, we always have a conversation when, when you're here around the energy sector. And, and this is such a great conversation about leadership and collaboration job creation, business development, economic development, bilateral trade, foreign direct investment. I mean, the, the list just goes on and on today because we have such a great conversation going about these U.S.-China collaborations that are going on with companies right here in our backyard. Yeah, and we've just had a great conversation with Professor Zhuang from CEFC in China and, and looking at the perspective from the Chinese perspective over to the U.S. and now we're going to sort of drill down on the more local perspective with the town manager of Firestone and, and really get into how this is helping us here in our Rocky Mountain region. Absolutely, and I love that we're going down to this micro level to really understand yeah. the implications here in Colorado. Our first guest is um, Wesley, um, our first guest is Wesley Lavanchi the town manager for the town of Firestone. He has worked with the town since 2005 and has lived in Will County since 1999. And back with us in this segment is Alan Barber, the president of Denver Hainan Corporation, who has extensive experience in developing U.S.-China relationships to create global business opportunities. Welcome to the show, Wesley. Thank you. Thank Welcome you to the show, Alan. Thank you. So, Wes, like, when we were coming back and during the break we were discussing that we're going to really shift the focus of this show to the more local perspective and I wanted to go back to something that the professor said in our last segment is that their first trip was in April and I was really interested to see that their uh, that Firestone hosted a dinner for this this sort of to create these relationships and I wanted to ask you how did why Firestone and how did that come about? Sure, actually it was our privilege to host them in April. Um, the, uh, it came about in the context our mayor uh, sits on the Metro Mayor's Caucus and actually kind of chairs up the International, um, or the Com Committee for International Relationships. And so through that, had had the chance to meet um, so uh, the relationships and the discussions kind of uh, uh, permeated out of that. Um, as you know, Firestone sits in southwest Welk County, and we're right on the edge of the, or right in the middle, actually, of the Nebraska field, which is a huge oil and gas field um, that they approximate has between a, a billion and a billion and a half uh, barrels of oil and gas there. So it's very natural for us to be at the heart of the energy discussion. And can you give a little bit of back, uh, background about sort of the development that has gone on in the past couple of years in your in your county and in Firestone? Sure. I mean, as has been um, evidenced by a number of news uh, news articles in the past six, eight, nine months, there has, in fact, Anandarko and Noble and others have actually been able to kind of go back and say, you know, we thought at one point we had kind of drilled out or substantially drilled out um, this field, but this shale oil and gas has, and, um, uh, and new techniques 
techniques in drilling have really brought to life a lot more reserves that are there. So I think everybody's kind of turned inward to say, wow, what a phenomenal amount of uh, assets and resources um, uh, are actually here in Weld County. And that in turn has played into jobs and revenue creation and those kind of things. And one thing that we were discussing with the professor during the last segment is this technology piece. Sure. And is there, are there public-private partnerships within Weld County and Firestone that you've been involved with to sort of uh, bring this technology in and, and how involved has Firestone been with that? Well, we certainly have been um, champions of, of uh, the oil and gas um, industry. In fact, our mayor has um, kind of led the charge through the Me uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus and through some discussions at uh, CSU um, as well. And you're right, you're really hitting on it. It's about how do we take advanced um, technology that has really kind of helped us do our job better? Because, you know, there has been con some concerns about, well, how do we get down there and how do we get it out and how are we stewards of the environment and um, and so and how do we build closed loop systems to um, to protect all of this and so with advances in technology um, uh, at the universities as well as through the, um, the various energy and gas companies it really has brought that whole thing forward. Whereas before we would have drilled 20 wells in a compressed area, now we're only drilling one because of the horizontal drilling. So we're, we really are kind of at the heart of, um, uh, heartbeat of that. So. Of that new technology yeah. and stuff. Alan, I want to come to you. You know, Firestone obviously is one of those, those center points of, of this conversation. But you're really at the heart of bringing together this sort of collaborative mentality that will go on between the cities here along the Front Range and here in the Rocky Mountains, as well as with um, our counterparts in Asia. Can you talk about what kinds of, of collaborations that, that you're hoping for, that you see coming to pass from these conversations and from these, these um, public-private partnerships and, and uh, delegations coming through and us going there and what are you hoping from that and, and where are we going with that? Uh, let's go forward and then move backwards. Okay. Uh, ultimately we would we want Colorado to be a global energy hub. We're already a US energy hub and somewhat of a global energy hub but more specific probably a or a US China energy hub. So what do we have to do to achieve that objective? Uh, first we have to develop very strong relationships with the appropriate companies and officials in China and the United States. Uh, the April trip was a beginning for this. So with Washin, which is a large Chinese privately held energy company not state-owned, it is private energy company, coming to, fire st coming to Colorado, meeting the people they need to meet, and then, in a sense, topping it off with a very nice gathering at the golf course in Firestone where everybody can get together and just develop friendships. Uh, I used to say, because the Chinese taught me this, Friendship first, then we do business. And I was having a discussion with a good friend of mine in Beijing, uh, who's part of CCTV, and I mentioned this to her, and she said, yes, friends do business with friends. So the importance of friendship is a key to this whole relationship. You just cannot go in, well, this is what I've got, here's a deal, here's the contract, will you sign? No, I don't know you, why would I sign the contract? you do business with people. Therefore, we have to start developing these relationships. As a result of the trip, uh, Mr. Zhuang is back to attend the Western Energy Annual, or Western Energy Alliance Annual Meeting, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, as a guest of the Alliance. So we're making progress and making it quickly. And I guess the other thing I would, the other comment that's important to make on this is it does not take a long time to do things, especially with China. And there is something called China time. And the best way I can describe China time, you mean you didn't have that done four weeks ago? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 
everything we're doing now is on China time. That means that it's not going to languish, it's going to be done quickly, and everybody has to be prepared to work on China time. And if somebody says, how is this, how, why is this? Think of how quickly China has grown from almost nothing in 1984 to the second largest economy. I think that hit it at 2010. So how do you do these things? You have to have executives who make really good decisions, but quickly. And that's what we have to adjust to so that we can do the same thing. Firestone has done a great job of that. The mayor of Firestone understands this. He is helping other metro mayors to understand this concept. So that's the base. Yeah. And then once we have the base, you know, we can bring in Colorado School of Mines. We can bring in CU, CSU as necessary. We can bring in the uh, oil and gas companies. We can bring in the service companies, uh, the guys who do all of the uh, work in the wells. Sure. So it creates um, variation on what Professor Zhuang said. This energy revolution is also an energy economic revolution. Yep. And it is something, energy is something we all need. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, how do you, how did we all get here today? We didn't ride bicycles. Yeah, it, it, what strikes me from this conversation is, is there are so many levels from, coming from both sides that we've discussed today that, you know, we have the local level and I mean, it really seems like pieces are coming together. And I'd also like to point out, I think I've known you long enough to know both of us, I think we like China time. <laughs> I love China time. <laughs> but, uh, so from the local level up, and, and it needs to, everybody has a role to play in this. And, and it just keeps going up the ladder. And it almost, in my mind, I'm visioning um, that the CEFC has their role to play. And then and City of Firestone has a role to play. And, and it's layered on top of each other. And, and one thing that we haven't really discussed here today is, is the Western Energy Alliance. And mm -hmm. where do they view their role in all of this and um, and how what are the next steps there or has that been defined it's it's being defined it'll be defined much more what well, today's Tuesday Wednesday Thursday and Friday in discussions first off the Western Energy Alliance I believe it's not confirmed yet will participate in the f July 28th energy forum in Shanghai additionally those independent oil and gas companies need better markets. They don't have the markets here um, because they have come up with technology that just, you know, it's supply demand and the supply is far outstripping the demand at this point. So where is the demand? Uh, a good secure demand where people can actually pay for it um, is China. And then on a longer term, we keep talking about the uh, US, China, U.S. trade deficit. Mm -hmm. By selling gas, oil, coal, we reduce that trade deficit. But we also continue to create new wealth and jobs in both the United States and China. So both countries benefit, and you bring them more closely together so that there's longer cooperation. So the alliance, is twofold, one, uh, well, three. Technolo technology is one, we have discussed somewhat, but the initial step would be the um, July 28th conference, or Energy Forum in Shanghai, and then working with members of the Alliance, and the Alliance is not just oil and gas companies, it's also service companies, law firms, to work through all of these issues that we need to work through to help the Chinese who have misunderstandings to understand the actual laws and regulations in the United States. We get through that and it's not going to take a lot of time. We're going to do it on China time. So we're not talking about, oh, it's going to take us five years. You know, maybe uh, optimistic a year. What I prefer is five months. But 
we probably can't travel back and forth that quickly. So it's that type of co collaboration required. And this is what I view as a global economy. In a global economy, you need to bring all of these forces together. It's not just a trading company or a company or a few individuals. Everyone has to work together as a team. If that team doesn't work together, these things don't move forward. Let me echo that too. Yeah. It's, it, uh, because all the literature I'm reading out of ICMA and NLC and everything else suggest exactly what Alan's talking about here. The new um, competitiveness when it comes to economic development and job creation is exactly what he's talking about. It's not simply about drawing a line on, on a map and saying, well, this is my territory or this. It's this blended effect that starts international and trickles down to the local level where there really aren't any lines on a map. So you have to be able to function um, in a much broader um, uh, environment, whether you're talking about regional cooperation, whether you're talking about national national co cooperation or what you're talking about international cooperation and you're blending a variety of, of businesses and, and groups and entities together. That's exactly what, um, what Alan's referring to. That's well, and, and I love that you guys are doing that and that the town of Firestone is serving as that best practice model around this blended collaborative um, effect that's going on. I mean, we're not seeing it done very well at a national level, if you will, um, in any sort of area, whether that's energy or whether that's the budget. But it's so refreshing to see the competitive lines being erased and, or blurred a little bit. And, and all of a sudden you're having these conversations and saying, you know what, we need to create jobs. We need to create a plan. We need to figure out the short term intermediate and long-term strategies that are going to bring success to our areas and here's what we're going to do about it and and i love that that's being done right here in our own backyard here in the rocky mountains especially in the energy industry and and once again colorado is a, a model for even other areas like the marcellus in pennsylvania and and you guys are really out front on that I, I have a question for you uh, from the more local perspective. Um, is there any concern that um, opening the doors to trade to China would deplete our reserves or, and you know, put us at a detriment? Well, you know, to me, I think the operative word here is stewardship. Um, we do need to be prudent and we do need to be careful, but when, you, but when you've been entrusted with assets, why not convert those assets into jobs that affect real right. people, that generate real income, that generate revenue for municipalities to put in infrastructure, that put food on the table? I mean, uh, sure, we, we ought to be prudent about that, but given the amount of reserves that we're talking about, we're talking multiple, multiple decades of, um, of, uh, of assets that can be used, that can create jobs, that can rebuild our our economy, um, I, I think it's we're neglectful, uh, you know, in, in uh, if we're not if we're not pursuing this. So sure, we ought to be careful. Sure, we need to be diligent. But at the end of the day, we have to take care of the families here in America. And one of the ways we can do that is is, is a partnership arrangement with other regions or or, or nations, um, and they can learn from us. And in, in exchange, we can we can gain from them as well. Right, and then and there are always these spin-off technologies. Like you never know what's going to happen, and then and so it creates other industries off of that. And so as you continue to grow and move forward, you can see yeah, what happens. There's a, there's a great example of that. To be yeah. honest, we look at the doors of that open. I think we're on the verge of seeing a whole new wave here. Um, so it's exciting. I'm excited as a as a manager. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and Alan, in our last segment, we were talking with Professor Zhuang about that they're very specifically interested in looking at shale technologies that are being implemented up there in Firestone and, and along those whole Rocky Mountain corridor. And, and I guess my question is really around, what does integration of this new technology mean for China? And then if we begin these conversations and we begin this bilateral trading engagement with them, what, is that, what does that look like for both sides? What are the implications of that? of sharing our technologies, of engaging in these, in these broader things? Because they always seem to beat us at everything in these well, technology areas. We're, this is an area we're ahead and we'll probably stay ahead. Uh, there are a lot of areas, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration. Uh, and going back to a previous um, company I was working with, uh, it was a smaller company great technology, but needed to move the, needed markets for the technology and needed to move the technology forward. So 
I found, well, working together, we found new markets which are in China, and China market's probably better than the U.S. market for this technology. We need to advance the technology because the, it's a small company competing with companies like Siemens, GE, and a research institute, um, a research institute, we'll call it, in engineering in Beijing, and a university wanted to work with us, and the university was in another province, um, to advance the technology. So take the technology where it is today and move it forward, because China needed the technology also. So it made a lot more sense for them to start where we were than start at zero point yeah. and try to bring it forward. With that kind of a combination, I would have taken on GE, Siemens, or any of these guys and won any day of the week because that's how much confidence I have in the R&D capabilities for the Chinese Institute. So you have a small Colorado company benefiting from this, growing into a much larger corporation. As you said earlier, as Kelly said earlier, you have all these spin-offs. That's what you want. You want to move things forward because then you have the spin-offs. So from a Colorado perspective or a U.S. perspective, we can advance our technologies probably more quickly and more efficiently. And in doing that, we've created another market at the same time, which is a very large market with China. From the Chinese perspective and also the U.S. perspective, I remember a few years ago, and I'm sure it's still there, uh, monitoring stations in California were picking up coal ash from China. As China moves forward with their shale gas production, they want to do more electric generation from shale gas. That will reduce, not eliminate, but reduce their reliance on coal. Mm -hmm. So some of these environmental problems will be corrected. And another misconception is that everybody says, well, China doesn't care about their environment. You have not been to China recently if you think that's still the case because China is very concerned about the environment. And the best way I can describe it, an old friend of mine said, we are the recipients of a Soviet-style planned economy where they didn't care where they put anything and what they did. Um, so the results of that are the China, China is saying, We've got to clean it up and we're never going to do this again because we need a good environment for our people. Mm -hmm. So it has many spin-offs and the spin-off is simple. We start in Colorado with selling shale gas, shale oil, and coal to China, helping them with clean coal. I know that, and this is outside a little bit, but Governor Mead of Wyoming is in China this week at a clean coal conference in uh, Xi'an. So there's a lot of effort being put forth in this area. You um, raise a good point about sort of the perception of what's going on and, and how people aren't aware that China is changing its environmental approach to some of these things. And then at the more local level, um, how are the consumers in Weld County, do they, do they understand the importance of the natural gas industry and then also to their economy? And then also, do they, uh, how, how can we get the word out better about these unique relationships? And, yeah, and let me back up first yeah. to say, you know, if technology were static, well, you may have some concerns that somebody might catch up to you. But I think we all yeah. know that technology is advancing yeah. you know, uh, more quickly each and every year. I think. Uh, in America, we ought to take pride in our institutions and say we ought to be on the cutting edge of developing technology. Let's not yeah. worry about people catching up to us and us giving away something. Let's be charging forward and keep developing. And that yeah. that will in turn 
protect us. If, yes. we're, if our universities are at the cusp, which is why education funding is so important, but I yeah. digress. Um, in Well <laughs> County, of course, um, we see the impact because those, tr those um, uh, trucks and those jobs drive up and down our roads every single day. They're in our supermarket shopping. They're, they're building the houses. They're buying the houses. And in turn, this, uh, the severance um, uh, funding and revenue is coming back to rebuild those roads, to put in those playgrounds, to build those trails, to build those sports complexes. That assessed valuation is coming into our coffers because of oil and gas production. So it's a real live issue for Well County and even in Firestone. We certainly see the implications. Of course, we want to be prudent. Of course, we want to be smart. But at the same token, we realize the, the tremendous upside of, of, of oil and gas um, production. Absolutely. Well, Kelly, we're, we're almost out of time. Alan, I want to thank you so much for providing such great insight on what's going on and for helping build these broader conversations um, between Asia, China specifically, and our Western uh, region here. So thank you for the work that you're doing. And if you want to learn more about Alan's work, just Google Alan Barber, that's A-L-L-E-N Barber, B-A-R-B-E-R, -E and you can see some amazing work that Alan's been doing. And, and Wes Le Levanchi, I'm going to get that right, <laughs> darn it. Um, Wesley, I want to thank you. And, thank, you and so thank you so much at Firestone. Um, and for those of you who don't know where Firestone is, it's just east of Loveland in the Weld County area, correct? That's correct. And, and really at the center, at the hub of, of so much of the technologies that are going on in the energy industry here in Colorado. Thanks for opening your borders and thank you for being open to these collaborative um, conversations and for being at the heart of developing these relationships. And as always, Kelly, great conversation. And I, and I love that we talked about the new energy revolution, but the new economic revolution that comes with that. Yeah, it's all, once again, exciting stuff on Energy 101 on, on Driving Force Radio. Absolutely. So to learn more about anything that Kelly's doing, go to wie.globalnewenergynetwork.org. Or to learn more about CEFC and the work that Professor Zhuang is doing, go to chinaenergyfund.org. To learn more about what the town of Firestone is doing in these collaborations with um, China, go to firestone.co.us. And then to learn more about the conference that is coming up July 29th, I believe, 28th in Shanghai, China, go to theicosamagazine.com. Have a great weekend, and thanks for listening to Driving Force Radio, where every week we seek to discover what drives today's leaders.